Hi everyone, welcome to today's student-led journal club case study. Um, today I'll be introducing student Dr. Charles Faust. So student Dr. Faust is a fourth year KCU Joplin student applying to pediatrics. Uh, he does a lot of rural hiking, backpacking, and caving. And while he was traveling through the small towns of Missouri and Arkansas, he became interested in public health policy, specifically with access to medicine and how infrastructure can affect access to that. So last winter, he wrote a position paper discussing internet expansion to rural areas to increase telehealth opportunities. And today he'll be discussing what he learned and some of the difficulties facing our rural communities when it comes to the government expansion of internet infrastructure. So student Dr. Faust, I'll hand it off to you. All right, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, hey guys, thanks for tuning in or watching this later. So without further ado, an argument for government expansion of internet infrastructure to increase access to medicine through telehealth by me and like a whole bunch of other stuff. This is a pretty big topic and it's just really a lot of the things in it where X affects Y and Y affects Z and Z affects X and you really just can't talk about one little piece you're leaving out major parts of the story. So uh, this is me, uh, student Dr. Faust. Um, like I said, I'm part of the Joplin campus. I'm currently spending my fourth year in Cleveland, Ohio with my uh, partner, Jenna, com completing all my rotations out here. Um, I'm planning on applying pediatrics. You can see me here with the time honor tradition of trying to dislocate a child's shoulder so they can get a bullseye that all pediatric applicants must go through. Uh, um, here's the most important slide. These are our fur babies. This is Onion. He's kind of a jerk. Uh, this is Smiley. He's really stubborn. And we don't have this cow, but we hope to have a cow one day. Uh, we found this farm in St. Louis. Uh, this cow evaded uh, the police for three days after escaping a slaughterhouse. So we thought that was pretty cool. And we like to help uh, feed him cleaner when we uh, used to live in Missouri. So like they said, in my spare time, I do a lot of hiking in uh, rural Arkansas and Missouri, specifically Northwest Arkansas and Central Missouri. Uh, Joplin students, if you haven't head down to Ponca or Jasper, it's about two hours south, you're really missing out. All of these photos are taken from that area. It's an absolutely gorgeous and unique part of the country. And you're just really missing out on part of the Joplin experience if you aren't exploring some of the awesome uh, nature that comes with it. So when I can, I try and bring some friends with me. I think half the time they run away when they see me approaching because half our conversations go, hey, you want to drive two or three hours to go hiking for a little bit? But uh, when they do, I think they enjoy it because we get some pretty good pics like these um, and these as well. Usually I try and get some good pictures of them because that's half the fun, just showing everyone all the cool things we get along with along the way. This is one of my favorite uh, caving photos. Missouri's full of caves. If you can, you should definitely get a chance to do that. But uh, why this topic, why this type of research? You know, it's not really traditionally what you would think of for med student research. And really, I became interested in all the communities I visit on my hikes. I would go every weekend or every weekday that I could and drive through them. And I noticed a lot of uh, lack of amenities that would be considered normal where I live, either in Joplin or in Cleveland. I would drive through a lot of towns where the only standing building would be the post office and it would be smaller than the Joplin bookstore. I never saw a grocery store. I never saw a, you know, a pharmacy or a CVS. And when I would stop at maybe a mom and dad bed and breakfast or like a vegetable stand, I would talk to people and just, you know, how they live their lives and whatnot. And some of the stories they told me kind of got me interested in public policy. But the pandemic really showed the importance of that. Um, I saw our faculty and staff, I saw doctors I know going and advocating for their communities trying to get the information out there, trying to get good policies in to keep their community safe. And I really just saw, you know, front and center how important that role of a physician can be. And to be honest, I'm not really a fan of traditional research. I think it's incredibly important. I find it interesting to read about it, but I personally um, just uh, I'm not the biggest fan of doing it. I like doing this instead because it kind of combines my, my love of nature, my love of rural medicine, my interest in politics all together in one cute little bag. So the state of rural health. So before we get into this argument for expansion of internet and infrastructure, we should probably just give some background. Uh, so about 25% or one in five Americans live in rural areas, which may be more or less than you thought the number would be. Um, interestingly, about 90 to 97% of America uh, landmass is considered rural, depending on who you ask. 
Um, the distribution of healthcare is uh, vastly different than in suburban or urban areas. So in rural areas, there's about 65 primary, primary care docs per 100,000 compared to 105 primary care docs per 100,000 in suburban and urban areas. And when you look at the numbers comparing specialists, it, the numbers get even worse. These communities essentially have a lack of physicians, um, especially with specialists, but importantly, they have a lack of primary care physicians too, which is you know, the backbone of preventative health and the backbone of medicine in general. So already just with the infrastructure issues, we had this additional issue of not as many physicians compared to uh, suburban and urban areas. Um, and one of the ways this was kind of, uh, one of the ways that uh, this was kind of gotten around was through telehealth. And telehealth, for those who don't know, is essentially uh, you're FaceTiming your doctor. And you can do that for office visits. And before the COVID-19 pandemic, there was quite a few restrictions on this. Um, there was a lot of restrictions for uh, going across state lines. There was restrictions on how often you could do it. There were restrictions on who could do it, the devices that could be used, the technology that could be used. And when the COVID-19 pandemic struck and people couldn't go to their doctor's office, um, they or uh, governments realized, you know, we need to kind of scale back some of these regulations. Um, maybe some of them might be unnecessary because people need to see their doctor and they need to do it safely during this pandemic. And so the CDC showed a 50% increase in dental health visits for 2020 in the first quarter. And this isn't, this isn't just for COVID-19 related visits, it's for all visits in general. Uh, this is due in part to the removal, like I said, of restrictions and regulations. And the CARES Act was a driving force behind this. So looking at some of these changes, so there was increased reimbursement before the CARES Act. Um, depending on the type of telehealth visit, you weren't always going to get um, the same amount of reimbursement from Medicare or Medicaid that you would from an office visit. So. Uh, They've changed that so that now reimbursements are equal. You get the same for a telehealth visit that you would get for a um, office visit. And they actually even increased it in rural areas to uh, further incentivize telehealth. Um, consent uh, could now be obtained essentially at any time um, for the telehealth visit, which was beforehand, there's kind of some rigid requirements for consent. And it also needs to be uh, only renewed annually as opposed, to as opposed to multiple times throughout the year. Um, where telehealth, telehealth can be used. So before telehealth, really, there is restriction. You know, it has to be in the doctor's office. You have to be in the hospital or in the clinic. And the insurance rules are like, hey, you know, if you're in a secure place, if you're in your house, if you're in your office, and it's secure, you can use your, um, you can do your telehealth visit there. Um, expanded access and privileges were given to other health professions. So um, any uh, now third and fourth years can remember that during my second year, my mom came to give a talk about how physical therapists interact with uh, physicians. And she was telling me how that because of the CARES Act, she can now do telehealth visits for her uh, patients if need be, which, um, you know, how keeps her safe, how keeps her parents safe, especially since she's doing so many home visits. This was also expanded to uh, occupational therapy and other uh, professions. So in-person visit requirements were relaxed, essentially, um, you can do more telehealth visits before an inpatient visit is required, or sometimes you can do, now you can do a telehealth visit before an inpatient visit, which is different how things were before. Uh, improved technologies, so um, you don't need any like uh, specific uh, web technology to do this. You can do it on Skype, you can do it on Zoom, as long as they enforce HIPAA, as long as they're secure, you can use those for your telehealth visit. You can use your cell phone. You don't need to use your camera. Again, as long as it's secure, you're using software that um, the Office of Civil Rights um, states is secure, then you are good to go. And they think things as like uh, Skype and Zoom are fine. However, they have said that you should not do your telehealth visits through TikTok, which is probably a good thing. But I thought it was funny you wanted to just mention that they specifically said, please, please, please do not use TikTok for your telehealth visits. So how did the public respond? Uh, they loved it. Uh, there was a large amount of satisfaction with these. People were relieved that they could go see their doctor without potentially putting their health at risk during the pandemic. And overall, very large satisfaction. Um, it should be noticed that um, the younger ages and the female gender were the more, more likely to say they weren't the biggest fan of telehealth. But like I said, overall, the public enjoyed uh, this increased expansion and liked seeing their doctor through a webcam. But uh, as with most, as with a lot of things, there are inequities with telehealth, specifically with access. And um, you know, expanding 
telehealth, getting uh, scaling back these restrictions and regulations in a safe and responsible way are great, but this expansion does not actually help those who need it the most if they can't even access telehealth at all, in general, or whether that be through lack of access or lack of funds. And that's kind of what this talk is about, is talking about how it's really great that we, um, we make telehealth easier, but if you don't have an internet connection or an internet connectable device, then these, um, this new expansion doesn't really benefit you at all. It doesn't really change your situation. So uh, Roblox to telehealth in rural areas specifically. Um, so telehealth uh, typically requires broadband speeds. This is defined by the FCC as 25 uh, megabytes per second uh, for download and three megabytes per second for upload. This is generally what's needed to have a stable video connection uh, between two parties. There's additional technical requirements and there's uh, licensing requirements. So technical, uh, both parties need webcams, obviously. You can uh, do telehealth um, without webcams, but you know, it makes it harder, especially if a patient maybe has a dermatological issue, or even just, you know, when we walk into a room and we see a patient, the first thing we're doing is that general statement. How is the patient appearing today? Does the patient appear sick? Do they appear ill? You can't really do that without a webcam. So it's important to have that, and webcams cost money. Excuse me. Uh, the office staff needs additional training. Excuse me. They, you know, they need to know how to set the patient up in the waiting room. They need to know how to cover any technical difficulties that may arise. That's just additional costs for um, clinics and clinics in rural areas are already kind of cash strapped and might have some difficulties with that. The patient also needs to be somewhat tech savvy, right? The patient needs to not have their, you know, the phone super close to their face. They need to understand how to use it. They need to understand if they hit the mute button by accident, what's going on and how to fix it. Um, and that can be a barrier with some uh, older populations or just uh, populations that aren't used to using that technology. Uh, licensing can be an issue. So typically providers need a license in the state they practice and if telehealth crosses state lines, they need a license in that new state. So even if your office is in Joplin, Missouri and you're providing a service to you know, uh, Oklahoma, which is 10 miles away from the state border, you would theoretically need an Oklahoma state license to do telehealth. Now, there have been some changes in this due to shortages in COVID. Before shortages in COVID, there was about nine states that had laws and um, temporary licenses or special licenses for telehealth. Texas, for example, you could, someone out, out of Texas, out of state from Texas could read diagnostic services and give you the image results, but they had to transmit them and explain them to a Texas-based physician. But um, with the COVID uh, pandemic and healthcare shortages, uh, that's changed just under half of the US currently has a waiver system. And of that half, about half have a uh, short-term um, thing on the books and a half of a long-term. But 32 states still have no um, way to kind of get around this roadblock, which you can imagine as you see next slide can be an issue. So let's say that you are a primary care physician and you want to work in rural areas. You want to try to expand your net and expand access by doing telehealth. And let's just say, um, so on this map, the darker green, the more it's rated by the uh, National Health Service scores as needing primary care docs and needing more access to healthcare. So the darker the green, the less access there is. And if you wanted to go in the southeastern corner of Missouri, where there's a lot of dark green and lighter shades of green, you could potentially need licensing for Missouri, um, Illinois, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, and Arkansas. So that would be a very big burden on the physician and the practice to keep up with all those requirements, to keep up with the testing, to keep up with the cost. And it's just one of the uh, burdens that can be in place when trying to expand telehealth opportunities to communities that um, are on state borders. So uh, internet gaps. So this is the main topic we're talking about today. So uh, in 2018, the Broadband Progress Report, which comes out about every two years from the FCC, Show that 24 million Americans lack access to fixed or reliable broadband speed. So they don't have that speed necessary to do a telehealth visit. And this lack of access is not evenly distributed. So in rural areas, about 31% of people do not have this access. In tribal areas, it's about 36%, as opposed to urban areas where only about 2% do not have access to these speeds. Um, these findings are contested, however. Uh, the Pew Research Center claims that two thirds of Americans don't have broadband access. They, um, and also found that those with 43% of an income below 30K access, sorry, $30,000 a year at a lack of access. This uh, disconnect or um, contesting essentially comes from the FCC's data is reported by the IP or the internet provider companies directly. 
And there's some concern that they're not being, they're kind of fudging the numbers. And essentially that if they're in one of the districts that they're reporting for, and if two houses in there have broadband speeds, they say the whole district has speeds as opposed to going by every single person individually. And, um, and the FCC said, well, look, when, I mean, sorry, the Pew Research Center said, well, that doesn't really um, be honest with the data because even if every single house has the potential to be hooked up for broadband in your area, if you don't have the income to afford it, it might as well not be there at all because you can't get it. And then, and therefore just saying it's there doesn't really give the full picture of what access is like for Americans. And on uh, the next slide, uh, so this is a graph using data pulled from Microsoft. Essentially the blue boxes are the percentage of people used and this is on counties, are the percentage of people using internet at 25 uh, meg megabytes per second or above. So those speeds for broadband. So if it's, a blue box, less than 50% are using those speeds, regardless of if there's allegedly access in their area or not. And then you can see right here where I'm hovering, this is Jasper County where Joplin is. And if you do a, and you know, Joplin has internet, it's the sizable area for the area. But if you just drive 20 minutes south of the Neo Show in Newton County, um, less than 50% of the people are, are using these speeds. And you know, is it a lack of access? Is it because it costs too much? It's honestly a combination of both. Um, and you and through various areas on this map, but sometimes it's, uh, I believe in New Mexico, they were talking how a lot of these areas have access, but it, essentially the poor populations are priced out. So in reality, they don't actually have access to these speeds. But you can just see from this map on a county basis, how widespread this problem is, especially in the rural areas in the Midwest and the American South and the West, uh, West US as well. So, uh, so this uh, talk is kind of going, you know, we have this, we have these issues with healthcare access in rural areas. We think that expanding internet access is a way to increase telehealth to, you know, make that problem better. But why is this the government's job? Why can't the individual just pay for it? Or why can't uh, we just not provide it? So really it just comes down to cost, right? Broadband expansion is very expensive. You have to go in, you have to physically lay the lines down. The fact that these rural areas are in, you know, hard to reach areas with, um, you know, rougher roads further from where people live, where the workers live does not make it any less expensive. And essentially fiber internet costs about 44 to $55,000 per mile. And in the, and for transparency, fiber internet is faster and a little more expensive than uh, regular broadband internet, but um, this would be the right way to do it just because fiber lines last a lot longer than your copper lines with traditional internet. If you lay down copper lines, it'd be a little cheaper, but it would, uh, you would start to have problems within a few years with uh, connectivity issues and maintenance would be very expensive. So this would be the right way to do it, which is why I did it for the example. And the numbers were um, a little more rounder. So forty-four to $55,000 per mile to lay the cost. So let's just say that's the lay a mile of, uh, internet in the center of the street where two houses border, okay? Um, issues of cost and labor, like I said, are complicated in rural areas. You have to get everybody there, usually, you know, about a drive for an hour. You've got to, there's not stuff for lunch or anything. There's not maybe bathroom facilities. It's in a rougher area and whatnot. So that increases your cost. And it's quite simple when you look at all this and we'll go over a math, uh, math example in the next slide. Private companies will not make a profit due to, this, due to the low population. So they have no incentive and quite frankly, do not want to go in and extend internet access to these areas. The, uh, rural, broadband the rural Broad Broadband Association essentially gives three options to deal with the cost. Uh, you can increase the consumer cost, but salaries in rural areas tend to be a little bit to a lot, cheap, a lot less than in their suburban and urban counterparts. And just because there's a lot um, less people there, the cost would be way higher than for their suburban counterparts. So that's not really the best solution, um, especially that leads to them not being able to afford healthcare anymore. You can use government funds or no service provided. But since no service provided does not help the issue at all, it's really not a viable solution to provide. So really government funds are the best way to go about doing this because of the high cost. This is really not something the individual can do for themselves government needs to step in and provide the funds or subsidies to do so. And, you know, I'm not there. I don't want the government, you know, using my tax money to pay for Netflix. I think it's important to that, you know, that's not what the goal is. Like, yes, they'll have access to movies and Netflix, but they will have access to um, better healthcare among other things. Uh, 
And this is obviously with not without precedent, you know, roads, electricity, phone lines, these are all available in these rural areas most of the time due to government subsidies where the government stepped in and provided the funds so that these areas could be safer and more accessible to the rest of the country. So here's our math example, all right? We, um, we had $55,000 per mile for fiber internet costs, right? So that's a mile in the center of the street. But from that in the center of the street, we ended up to run lines to all the houses. So let's just say that's $600 per home to go from the street to the house, all right? And 80 homes per mile. So that essentially doubles the cost from 55 to $100,000. The average monthly cost of the provider, so like the server costs, the maintenance, all that fun stuff, that's $32 a month the company has to pay for this maintenance fee. The subscriber is paying $65 a month for the service. So the net profit or revenue per home is $33. So the total project would be that $55,000 plus an additional $55,000 um, to connect all the homes coming out to about uh, $1,287 per home. And this is assuming every home signs up, but if you know, only 32 of those homes signs up, the cost per home jumps to $2,300. And if you divide all this up and it's only those 32 homes, it's gonna take six years for the provider to break even on their investment. It'll take about three to four years if it's all the homes, but if it's just 32, it's six years. And that's in a normal area. If we're talking a rural area where the roads are curvy, there's these rivers or these mountains in the way, it's not gonna be a straight line. It's gonna cost a lot more to lay these lines. It's gonna cost more to hire workers to come out and do everything. The, the cost will be even longer and the time to break even on their investment will be even higher. And later on, I have an example for one of my personal experiences in this county. So we'll do that math in a little bit. But uh, moving on. Well, so like, why should we care, right? These were places are hard to reach. They don't have internet. They seem to be kind of doing okay right now. Why should we care and expand this telehealth expansion? And really as for the physicians, we should care because our goal should be that everyone in our country and hopefully the world has access to medicine. That's good for the healthcare of the world. It's good for medicine in general. And, you know, expanding internet access to expand telehealth opportunities gets rid of some of the biggest barriers to medical care access in these rural communities. There are large distances between homes and rural communities. The population density is a lot smaller than suburban and urban areas. That means that if you're going to do a rural clinic or a rural hospital, your net of patient population is going to be a lot wider. That's a big geographic radius. And that's a long distance for your patients to come to you. So if you have telehealth, you can offer your services to a wider population and therefore incre uh, have an increased revenue to make sure your clinic can stay open and keep providing services that are desperately needed in these communities. Uh, these large distances that you would have to cast um, and would be alleviated by the telehealth are also distances that your patients have to travel to come to you. And if your patient has to drive an hour, an hour and a half, and I had patients during my third year rotations who were driving an hour, an hour and a half to our clinic or two hours to St. Louis to receive specialized care for their, uh, their kids or themselves, those travel times were discouraging. That was a whole day patients, uh, parents that had to take off work to drive their child to St. Louis. So they're missing a day of work and they got the additional cost of that um, healthcare in general. And quite frankly, they didn't wanna do it. They were exhausted coming to our clinic and then telling us they would go to St. Louis the next day. And if you can decrease that amount of visits through telehealth, if you can do some follow-ups through there, they're still gonna have to come to you occasionally. <clears throat> um, telehealth is of course no um, pure substitute for inpatient visits. But if you can decrease that financial cost, decrease that travel burden, you're gonna you know, increase their financial health, you're gonna increase their mental health and you're gonna incentivize them to come to you because it's easier and you're gonna increase their health overall. And this you know, only helps solve primary care issues, but also access to specialists, to dietitians, to addiction counselors, all these problems that affect rural communities um, can be alleviated by these increased resources. And we'll talk about this again further, but also just imagine um, your patients leave your clinic and go home. And if they have better internet, faster internet, more reliable internet, all the educational resources they can use. Instead of demonstrating in the office, you need to do these stretches or these activities to help out um, after your surgery. If they can go home and they know the name and they can YouTube how to do those stretches, there's a much higher chance they can do them safer and more effectively and um, increase, improve their uh, recovery time post-surgery or anything. They can look up stuff about, you know, good diabetes recipes for to keep their blood sugars in the appropriate range without on um, and potentially order those ingredients over the internet. 
Um, you can also potentially watch them do their exercises to make sure they're doing them right, seeing if they're having any issues or any restrictions. Um, the uh, telehealth can potentially have a great impact on healthcare costs. So the U.S. spends about 12 grand per year per person, and 27% of these costs are due to preventable illnesses. Uh, diabetes, for example, affects about 10% of the U.S., but the costs are um, estimated at 327 billion in 2017. Obesity, a prevalence of about 42%, estimated cost of $147 billion a year. Uh, the uh, effects and the incidence of the above and more could potentially be decreased or eliminated through increased primary care access through telehealth. If you can see patients more often, if you can follow their A1Cs more often than ones that live far away in these rural areas, you can head off potentially their diabetes. You can make it so they don't need as much insulin, so they don't have to spend as much money on it and they're just living healthier lives. Maybe you avoid an amputation or you know, the special boots and whatnot, these increased costs to our healthcare system, doing this preventative medicine to keep costs low and patients healthier. Um, as I said, patients will have increased access to educational material, exercise resumes, resulting in increased quality of life. The possibilities are literally endless. But uh, there's also a bunch of non-medical benefits by this too. So even just getting away from the medical side and talking about how this affects these communities positively in other ways. Um, it's gonna increase cultural and economic opportunities. And I've got a personal example we'll show next, but just uh, some of the things that increased broadband is shown and predicted to improve is higher property values, increased job and population growth, high rates of new business formation, lower unemployment rates. These are all possible with increased internet access. And these are all things that rural communities quite bluntly desperately need um, as we go forward. Cost benefits in Indiana observed a three to four fold return on investment, not even counting state and local government's cost savings on medical expenses and the additional tax revenues they would get from the increased incomes caused by um, expanding internet into their rural areas. So I do a lot of hiking and whatnot. And about two years ago, I went to Whit Springs, Arkansas. I traveled down from Fayetteville, did some hiking here, went on 40, got off here, and traveled to where I was staying um, from an Airbnb. And I was on dirt roads for probably the last hour and a half of the drive. Absolutely gorgeous, but a little treacherous with my Honda Accord. And I was without cell service for 36 hours. When I got home, I had my partner, my parents calling me. They couldn't get a hold of me. They were wondering what was wrong. I just, just did not have service for 36 hours. And this is the cabin I was staying in. Um, the people who were renting this for me, they, built several of these cabins on their property by hand themselves with their children. Essentially, when their children turned 18, they built them these cabins from the stay in on the property and they built it all by hand. And they had a photo book inside showing them building it. And when their children went on missionary trips around the world, they would rent these cabins out to people as a little income. And uh, going to the next slide. So they built themselves for their children. They used wood stoves for heating. They rented them for extra income. They were able to get internet, but only because they were on the opposite end of the Arkansas Grand Canyon. And they basically got internet beamed on a laser line of sight to their house. And I reached out to them recently when I was originally doing this paper. And they told me that, you know, they get internet because of where their house is located, it's kind of on a hill. But if there's a storm or there's fog, or even if a tree grows too tall, they will lose internet. Anything that breaks that line of sight, they don't get internet. But they could not get this extra additional income, which they needed without that internet access. Um, to, get, to give an idea of how rural and isolated they are, when I got there, the owner came out and he was really worried. He said, oh my God, I forgot to tell you, and I know you didn't have service for a while getting here. Did you bring any food? We don't have a grocery store. The closest grocery store is 60 miles away. And if you've done any driving in rural areas, you're like 60 miles in a rural area is not an hour. It's about an hour and a half and two hours. And I assured him, I had my staple post hiking food. I had dinosaur chicken nuggets. I had pizza rolls. I was ready to go. But he was just so relieved because he had forgot to tell me people had shown up in the past. And they just basically invited these people in for dinner at their house because there was no possible way for them to get food. That's how isolated they were in this community. But um, here's a picture of the Arkansas Grand Canyon. Absolutely gorgeous. Two and a half hours from Joplin. Highly recommend you go. But essentially, they lived over here. And their internet was beamed from this side to the other side. And that's how they were able to get the internet. And you know, this canyon gets foggy, the trees grow on the mountaintops. If there's a heavy storm, they would essentially lose their internet. The beam could not get to them. 
But um, so before we talk about that hypothetical cost scenario above where we take, um, depending on how many houses signed up on that mile of internet, it would take three to six years for the uh, company to recoup their losses essentially. The county I was staying in, the county of which, the county which brings us in, Searcy County, has on average six homes per mile, on average. So half or less than that. So way less than 80. So doing all that math together, if all, if all six homes said, you know what, we're gonna all get internet, please put it in. It would take that company 24 years to break even. I honestly, I can't imagine any internet provider going in and saying, you know what, it'll take 24 years, we're gonna give you six people internet. Especially because this number is a conservative estimate and it would probably be much higher because like I said, they would have to get all the way out on those dirt roads, bring all their heavy equipment and whatnot to dig the line, put it in, and then run it to wherever the closest connection is, probably across the Grand Canyon. I don't have an exact number. It's hypothetical. I don't work in construction. But just from one of the, some of the stuff I was reading, I would not be surprised if so 24 years, this actual number was closer to 50 or 75, maybe even 100 years to recoup that investment. And that's assuming all homes continually pay for internet. Now, that was assuming homes pay $65. Um, but I mean, you could potentially shorten this time span, of course, but you would have to raise it so that home, the profit would be $134 a month, which would mean that essentially home, these um, home, homeowners in these rural areas would be paying anywhere between $160 and $200 a month in internet, which is incredibly expensive for internet. And I quite frankly doubt they would be able to or would just want to have that additional cost, regardless of the benefits. Um, so that kind of covers a lot of the internet, the arguments for expanding the internet, why it's so important to expand telehealth and increase that healthcare stuff. But I also want to talk about a topic that's been a little more mainstream, mainstream the past couple of years, um, and that's privatization of the postal service. So um, the postal service is very, very important for rural communities. Um, and quite frankly, it's integral home because they do not have internet. So the Postal Service is required by Acts of Congress to deliver mail to all postal addresses in all regions of the U.S. at flat rates. Um, so it costs the same to send a letter to, you know, rural Arkansas that does send it upstate New York. 18% um, of Americans, partially because they don't have access to reliable internet, have to pay their bills and their mortgages through by the mail. They have to mail it out. 20% um, of Americans get their medications through their mail. The Postal Service and integral for voting in towns um, that are too small to have polls. Um, and so really, you know, there was talks of privatizing the Postal Service, you know, UPS, FedEx will do it. But quite frankly, it's not clear that um, if they would expand this Postal Service to rural communities. Right now, they usually don't offer services to those communities. They get as close as their network provides and they have the Postal Service do the rest of the journey. It's called like the lost mile. We're talking about the infrastructure stuff. And there is genuine concerns that if we privatize or eliminate the postal service, because it is expensive, but it is a service, um, that lots of Americans will not be able to get their medications, not be able to reliably pay their bills, would be essentially cut off from the rest of the country. Um, when there was a lot of the debacle with the election and the postal service delaying stuff for various reasons, there was countless stories of Americans essentially being unable to get their um, to get their medications in time. Their medications they're doing, delivering them were delayed. There was one man in Columbus, so he was lucky. He was in a city, he had access to a pharmacy. His blood thinners got lost in the mail. He went to the uh, pharmacy, the CVS, with a new prescription. But the insurance company would not cover it because they had already paid for a service that was currently kind of lost in mail world. They couldn't get to him at the moment. And they were essentially gonna charge him, I believe it was $400 a week for those blood thinners. And he said, I had to pay it. I put it on a credit card. I had to pay it. I was, I was very high risk for clots. I did not want to risk it. And I paid $800 waiting for medication to show up. And these, I have never seen a CVS in these rural areas. Sometimes there's a very tiny mom and pop, like farm and feed grocery store, but I've never seen a pharmacy or a CVS. If this happened to some of these people in these rural areas, I have no doubt that there would be deaths involved because they could not get the medications. Uh, for their high blood pressure, for their blood thinners, for their cardiac arrhythmias, for their diabetes, there would be de deaths or 
massive uh, medical issues and loss of quality of life if posted service was eliminated and these medications were delayed. Um, so like I said, some insurer will cover prescriptions that are lost in the mail, they don't have access to pharmacies and policies that aim to eliminate, eliminate delaying slow and posted services in the US directly impact the healthcare of rural and disabled patients, potentially threatening their lives. Um, so that's kind of the surface level stuff in this position paper and the stuff I'm getting into with public policy, health, um, health access as a medical student, as a resident going forward. Um, but in summary, access to care in rural areas is often impacted by the infrastructure in those rural areas, which is often lacking compared to suburban, suburban or urban areas. Expansion of that infrastructure is, cross, is cost prohibitive for private companies to do. And because of that, it's important for funds from local, state, and federal sources are needed to expand the infrastructure to increase access to medicine and increase access to quality of life as well. And then, you know, this is not a zero sum game. This is not spending money and losing money. The preliminary data shows this will increase economic opportunities and increase incomes and quality of life in these areas. So uh, with that, uh, it's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Chip, this is Dr. Johnston. First know. of all, I want to say thank you very much for this presentation. It's very good. You're very uh, knowledgeable about this uh, uh, topic. And I'm just wondering, I understand obviously the, uh, the ramifications of a poor uh, or less fortunate, I should say, support system the further away you go from the uh, quote, let's say urban areas. Now, having said that, have you seen any studies uh, relevant to telehealth pertaining to um, the um, gravity of illness or the acuity of the illness? And what I say by that, there's a lot of medicine that can be done if everybody's relatively stable. The patient's uh, vital signs are relatively stable. They're not in acute distress. Uh, it's not an acute uh, situation rather than some chronicity. That's a different story. So have you seen any data from telehealth supporting acute care? And I'm saying that with respect to anybody that's doctoring by telehealth. But is there any statistics on, I'm not talking just a sore throat or that's acute. I'm talking chest pain, uh, a headache, worst headache you ever had, things like that. Have you seen that? I haven't seen specific studies though. I had, when I was looking at the licensing stuff, there was some talk about how, um, essentially doing almost an urgent care visit over telehealth, like a quick examination to see, um, because you know patients are concerned about when I go to the emergency room and I have to pay that cost, is it worth it? There has been some licensing stuff where they're saying, you know, okay, you can do a quick visit, do a quick assessment over telehealth to see should they actually go to urgent care. I think that, um, but I haven't seen any specific studies. I, I haven't either. Yeah, personally, and I, you know, I'm still a medical student, but, it's an idea that I am a little cautious about. I don't like, I'm a big supporter of telehealth, but I don't think it should be used to totally eliminate in-person visits. And I would be a little concerned about um, if telehealth currently with the technology we have can replace urgent care. I'd love to do a study on it, maybe in residency with more financial support. That might be an option. That's actually a very good idea. I'll be sure to reach out to you if I end up doing that but I'll definitely be on the lookout for the future. Thank you. There's no, no question that the support system is critical and ongoing communication and dialogue is, is pertinent. Even in this venue without examinations, et cetera, what you can do is exchange that history. And there's relevant uh, golden nuggets that can be get, gathered from the right line of questioning, assuming that the patient can converse uh, relatively well. So there's no question that this venue uh, far, far sur, uh, surpasses a lot of other uh, ways to have that dialogue, particularly distance wise. Um, you can get a quick assessment by just 
watching their body language or looking at the tone of or listening for their tone of voice and uh, how short of breath they might be and making the next sentence, et cetera. So you can kind of put it together like that. Those are all subtleties of expertise that you would acquire through telehealth. But there's also, uh, you're almost trying to uh, go into a fight with one arm behind your back. No, I 100% agree. There's definitely some limitations, and yeah. we should expand well, it, but also be, you know, cognizant of those limitations so that it doesn't negatively affect patients. Absolutely. Uh, again, I applaud you for your approach to this, and your depth of knowledge appears to be pretty strong. So, thank you for sharing. Thank you. This was a great presentation. Thank you, Student Dr. Faust. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? If not. I'm sure you, if you think of one later, you can always email them. But yep, feel free to reach out. Great. With that, thank you, everybody that joined us today. Again, great presentation. It was a really good talk.